lecture from Professor Sheridan L. Glassell. And to introduce, as well to chair, I kindly invite Mrs. Ika Deviana, PhD. Honorable professors, honorable academic senate, rectors, vice rectors, distinguished guests, and also students. There was a prince lived in Serendip, Ceylon, Sri Lanka, and his name is very famous because there are some inventions are based on his name. And there are some inventions also created from the very structure and plan objective. So there are some inventions as the results of the serendipitous moments. It is very honor for us, young generation here in Universitas Gajah Mada and in Yogyakarta, to have the visit and lecture from Professor Sheldon Lee Glashow. Professor Sheldon Lee Glesow will deliver the lecture on how basic science drive technological progress. Professor Sheldon Lee Glesow is an American theoretical physicist who received uh, the 1979 Nobel Prize for Physics. And when he was young, he began pursuing his interest in science. His brother, named Samuel, interested him in laws of valing bodies when Professor Glashow was 10. His brother, he is a dentist, was also the one who helped his father equip a basement chemistry lab for the young Professor Glashow at his age 15. And now we have Professor Glashow here when the student is ready, the teacher will come. We welcome Professor Sheldon Lee Glesow for his lecture. Okay, I think I'm set. Sorry for the delay. Uh, there's been some, to by the way, this is my first experience in this country, the largest country with the largest Muslim population in the world. And uh, mention has been made earlier of my good friend Abdus Salam, with whom I uh, shared the Nobel Prize. And I'd like to say a few words about him and about science in the Muslim world. Abdus was my good friend. I got to meet him when I first went uh, to live in Europe uh, in 1958. I had dinner at his home in, in England. Uh, in later years, I spent a few weeks with him in Istanbul uh, teaching a summer course. I've uh, met him at many conferences. He became a very good friend of mine, and Abdus was, very cons was a great scientist, of course, but he was very much concerned with science in the Muslim world. And he spent much of his efforts <laughs> trying to encourage a renaissance of Muslim science. He recalled to me the wonderful days in the 15th century when Muslims and Jews and Christians in Spain were working together, doing science together. And he dreamed of a time when Muslims could join with the other people in the world and enter the world of science. And uh, therefore, he was 
very, very honored to become the first Muslim winner of a Nobel Prize in Science. It is my hope, this being the largest country, the country with the largest Muslim population, I think it, would, it is, should be the responsibility of this country to show that the Muslims can again return to the forefront of science. And this country, with its enormous diversity of religion, of language, of topography, should lead the way toward the return of Islamic science. Anyway, let me turn to the main subject. I'm talking about how basic science drives technological progress, and vice versa. And in this connection, I hope I will leave enough time for wide-ranging questions, because there are many things I think we ought to discuss outside of this lecture. This lecture was prepared before I came to this country for the first time in my life. And I've learned so much about this country in such a short time uh, uh, that I, I, I wish I had visited before so I could have written a more relevant lecture. But let's go on. How basic science, oh, I push the button, nothing happens. Maybe I turn it around, who knows? Ah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, I'm, sorry, I'm learning. I think I'm learning. Uh, yes. So, uh, I'm going to go through some of these slides rather quickly. But I'm pointing out here that there are really two kinds of, uh, two ways to approach science. One is curiosity driven, where you are curious about how things work and somehow in the course of your uh, investigations, you fall upon some wonderful new discovery. This is how Rankin discovered x-rays. He was playing with newly developed vacuum tubes uh, in which there, are cathode, there, there are electrons going from one end to the other. And uh, playing around, he discovered x-rays. And uh, when he was asked what these were, he said he had no idea. When he was asked, what were you doing? He said, I was investigating. He wasn't looking for a device that could find uh, infection in, in teeth. He wasn't looking for a device that could find bullets in wounds. He was just investigating. In other cases, well, the same is true, by the way, with the discovery of penicillin discovered quite by accident. In other cases, plans are carefully laid to make a discovery. For example, it's not a very good example in the terms of science, but in, imagine the enormous effort that, the, uh, that was made by the Western, by America, to develop the atomic bomb. It was planned in detail. Uh, they made exactly what they thought they would make. The history of science is replete with examples of both methods of discovery, planned research, targeted research, and accidental or serendipitous research. Uh, some scientists focus on well-defined goals. They lay careful plans, then they look. This is the Kantian approach to discovery, named after Immanuel Kant, who developed the idea of the scientific method. Other scientists have more fun, and they listen to nature with open minds, and sometimes they discover amazing things, sometimes not. I call this the serendipitous approach. That's how Columbus discovered America. He didn't set out to get to a new continent. He was trying to get to China. Unlike, however, Magellan, who set out to sail around the world, and his boats did exactly that, although he never get, got much beyond this point in the world on his travels. The two approaches mix up on many occasions. Kantian efforts 
people who try to look for one thing often find something else. TNT was synthesized in 1863 and it was used as a yellow dye for decades until it was realized that it explodes and it became a very useful explosive. Thalidomide was a drug that was introduced in Europe in the 1950s. What? Oh, I'm not supposed to fall down. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't want to fall down there. Thanks. Yes, there is a. Yes, it is over here. There's a hole over there. Yes. Yeah, I've been known to fall down, so that's. Uh, thank you. Yeah, TNT has, uh, was recognized to be a clay. Thalidomide was introduced in the 1950s as a sedative for pregnant women, and it had disastrous effects. However, years later, it was recognized that it was a useful drug for other purposes, to treat cancer, to treat leprosy, quite accidentally. There's another dichotomy, a dichotomy between pure science and applied science. I don't know why that thing flashes at me. But uh, here, well, I, I have some examples. The discovery of the Higgs boson at CERN what does PK mean? It means it's pure physics and it's planned. It's Kantian, pure and Kantian. The discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012, which was a big deal in my field. Uh, the discovery of gravitational radiation, uh, uh, a prediction made by Einstein in 1915 was proven to be correct 100 years later in 2015. Both of those were Discoveries in pure science, Kantian. Serendipitous discoveries in my, the year of my birth, 1932, some British physicists discovered antimatter, positrons, the first known form of, uh, of, of antimatter. That was a, an example of pure science. It became practical. Positrons are useful, believe it or not. That's how PET, PET scanners work. They use positrons. Antimatter is important to medicine. Uh, fullerenes were discovered, buckyballs, uh, in 1985, and they too uh, became useful after a bit. Then we have applied science, applied and Kantian, planned science, with a purpose in mind. LEDs existed for many years and they were used as indicators on various devices, but there was no such thing as a blue LED until it was finally developed, first in Japan. And the blue LED made it possible to have white LED lighting. And now we have a revolution in lighting throughout the world where incandescent bulbs, which use a great deal of electricity, are replaced by LED lights, and that was a spectacularly important discovery. The first Chinese Nobel Prize in science uh, was awarded uh, recently for the, the discovery of the drug uh, from, from traditional uh, Chinese medicine, uh, artemisin. So it goes. Uh, here are some more discoveries of applied science, uh, the graphene in, in Britain, the giant magnetic resistance effect. You've never heard of that, but it's very important because uh, when, that, when it was discovered that mag the resistance of materials can be very much affected by a magnetic field, it became possible to develop gigabyte hard drives, and that led to a revolution indeed. Hello. Yeah, that's right. That's the one I wanted. Uh, let's talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. Let's talk about light to begin with. Isaac Newton developed the, showed that light can be taken apart into its fundamental colors. He decided there were seven co uh, colors in the rainbow. Uh, seven, in analogy in, with music, and that, that's an interesting fact in itself, which I don't have time to discuss. William Herschel would go to the beach to get sunburned, but as he's in the beach, he recognized, as we all do, 
that the sun conveys heat as, ver as well as light. And uh, Herschel, quite by accident, in attempting to determine which color carries heat, is it red, is it yellow, is it orange, is it blue? No, it's something invisible. It's an invisible form of light, infrared radiation. He found it completely by accident. He wasn't looking for it. He made lots of discoveries by accident. He discovered the planet Uranus, a new planet. By the way, uranium was named after, it was discovered in the same year that he discovered Uranus. And so uh, that's why uranium is called uranium. That was a serendipitous discovery. A contemporary of his, Johann Ritter, just a year later, decided that if there's something funny going on on the red side of the spectrum, there has to be something strange going on on the blue side of the spectrum. He discovered, quite by planning, ultraviolet radiation. Then we come to Heinrich Hertz. Heinrich Hertz was a rare example of a physicist who could under, do experiments and understand theory. And he decided that he would confirm the theory of electromagnetism and find a new form of radiation, radio waves. So in 1888, he produced a device that sent radio waves from one side of his laboratory to the other. And within a few years, people like Marconi developed wireless telegraphy, an enormously important uh, development in those days. That was, uh, uh, that was a discovery by planning. We come to a serendipitous discovery of x-rays. We mentioned that. And another serendipitous discovery, the discovery of the cosmic microwave background. That discovery led to the explosion of discoveries in cosmology and astrophysics. It is because of that discovery that we learned the age of the universe. We know the age of our universe to a precision of 1%. That's pretty good. Oh, I should say, uh, when I was uh, a youngster, I heard a lecture by a famous physicist named, a Dutch physicist named Casimir. And Casimir uh, explained to me how it was that we are electromagnetic creatures. We are creatures of electromagnetism in everything we see, feel, hear, smell, taste, or do. For the theory of electromagnet, well, why is that? Well, because it's electromagnetism that explains why atoms are the way they are. Electromagnetism keeps the electrons in an atom closely bound to the atomic nucleus. The nucleus just sits around. It's not too important uh, ordinarily to us. The force that's important to us is electromagnetism and, of course, gravity to keep our free feet to the ground, the oceans where they belong, and the air around us. Many accidental discoveries led to the theory of electromagnetism. By Galvani, by Ersted. Ersted discovered the first relationship between electricity and magnetism. He showed that electricity can, pro can produce magnets, can produce magnetic effects. Faraday showed the converse, that electricity can, uh, that moving magnets can produce electrical effects. So between the two of them, one showed that electricity can make magnetism, the other that magnetism can make electricity. And there have been a lot of people working on the theory of electromagnetism. Here is a brief list. Uh, none of them became particularly wealthy. None of them started companies. Well, Tesla tried, uh, but failed. But basically, you, you don't want, he doesn't want to get me too close to that thing. Okay, I'm going to move over here. I'll be, now I'm safe. You won't have to worry about it. I'm just trying to keep everybody awake because they want to see me fall down. Nah, that's not true. So these people 
Again, we're not trying to make companies. We're not trying to sign non-disclosure agreements with one another. But they just wanted to understand electromagnetism. And because, thanks to them, we had the second industrial revolution, the electrification of the world, which gave us lights, motors, elevators, air conditioning, you name it, radio, television, and such. Now we come to quantum mechanics. Now quantum mechanics uh, was developed by a, a lot of people. Here's a list of some of them. Madame Curie is in there with Niels Bohr, Max Born. Ma many of them were quite young. People like Dirac, de Broglie, and uh, Jordan, and uh, Pauli were really very young people, Heisenberg uh, kids. And they were dreamers. They were trying to understand the world. These dreamers were the creators of quantum mechanics, a keystone of modern physics. They had lots of fun puzzling out and arguing about the mysterious new theory that they were building. They had no patents, no startups, no signed non-disclosure agreements, and they developed no product. Yet today, quantum mechanics underlies something like a third of the GNP of the world. So fooling around can pay off. What did basic science do for medicine? Well, so much. You go to a hospital, you can be scanned in various ways. There are CAT scanners, there are PET scanners, there are MRI scanners, there are even combinations of, this, of several of them. But all of these scanners were developed from basic scientific discoveries, those of x-rays, positrons, and at Harvard, nuclear magnetism. We'll talk a lot about, about radioactive isotopes, which were a curiosity when they were discovered around 1912 or so, but have become extremely important. The cyclotron was developed in 1934. It's one of the earliest atom smashers, though it's not an atom smasher, it's a nucleus smasher. Anyway, the first cyclotron was not very big. It would fit on my palm. It was four inches in diameter. Today, the largest accelerator is 17 kilometers in circumference, five miles in diameter. We'll talk more about accelerators. They're used for so much. Lasers were developed, uh, invented in 1957. Uh, they were used, they're used universally now for surgery. In fact, two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, my eyes were operated on by lasers. And now I don't really need glasses anymore. I just wear them because I like to wear glasses. <coughs> so we see there have been many uh, discoveries in, uh, of basic science that have implication for medicine. Let's turn to information technology. The first industrial revolution, having much to do with science, depended on steam engines, steam turbines, and and uh, steamboats. The second industrial revolution was the electrification of the world. The third industrial revolution is that of, of, of computers and information technology. The first computer revolution took place when, you remember, those of you who study the history of, of, of co computation know that the earliest computers used vacuum tubes lots and lots of vacuum tubes. Transistors made possible the first computer re revolution. Integrated circuits, the discovery of which won a Nobel Prize, by the way, uh, it was responsible for the second computer revolution. So it goes. Uh, PK cryptography, personal key cryptography, has to do with codes and code breaking. Cryptography is the making of putting things into secure codes. And that has vast applications in the financial industry. We mentioned magnetoresistance and multi-gigabyte disks. High-T superconductors make possible MRI scanners. The World Wide Web, invented at CERN by scientists, for scientists, 
spread like a disease throughout the world, and now everybody is familiar with the internet. Quantum ma manipulation uh, will also lead to new science, new technologies having to do with quantum computers. Many of these discoveries earned Nobel Prizes. Oh, OK, no signal. No signal. What did I do? Help. Uh, it doesn't seem to work anymore, and I can't remember what, how to do it. Can somebody help? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it worked. this thing didn't work. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. oh, I see. This thing failed. OK. Good. I have to look that way to do this. Now I can do it. Huh. You point it this way? OK. That's good. It's black. If I point it that way, it's flat. There's no signal. Where? Wonderful. Thanks. Okay. Just keep pushing that button. Yeah, I know it's that button. <laughs> Careless chemists with eyes wide open. Is that where I want to be? No. Uh, yes. OK. There are two disciplines that are filled with accidental discoveries, actually more than two, many disciplines. The search for new dyes. I list on the left, on the left a number of colors that were invented uh, by accident. A Prussian blue, mauve, magenta, trinitrotoluene, synthetic indigo, and monostrel blue. Uh, let's just focus on one or two of them. This, the discovery by Henry Perkin, a 17-year-old chemist, discovered the first aniline dye. He was just a kid in England. A visiting professor from Germany came by and told him that he should synthesize, uh, what's it called? Uh, what, what do you? treat malaria with uh, quinine. It told him to synthesize quinine. Was it quinine? I don't know. I've forgotten at the moment. Anyway, it didn't matter because he didn't make it. He failed. Uh, he made a mess. He proceeded to, to do the destructive distillation of wood, which is something I tried to did when I was a little kid. And when you do that, you make a mess. A, a smelly, disgusting tar. You heat wood up in air, and it becomes a mess. But he noticed that it had a slight purple color. And so he extracted that purple dye and marketed it and became very wealthy. It was a completely accidental discovery. He did not produce what he thought he would produce, but he made something much better. The same is true with artificial sweeteners. There are many artificial sweeteners used in America, saccharin, cyclamates, aspartame, acesulfane, sucralose. How were they discovered? Well, in one case, one of the experimenters was fooling around uh, trying to find a new treatment for, for heart disease. And he was smoking, because back in those days, chemists would smoke in the laboratory, put his cigarette down on the workbench, put it back in his mouth, the cigarette tasted sweet. He had discovered a new sweetener. To hell with his heart medicine. He went off and uh, marketed his sugar. So it goes with acesulfane. Acesulfane was accidentally discovered. By the way, it's the secret ingredient of Coke Zero. For those of you, it's a disgusting drink, I know, but uh, it's a lot better than previous versions of Coca Cola. Uh, sucralose is a compound of, of, of uh, sucrose with, with chlorine. I don't know why it was invented, but there was an Indian graduate student 
who was involved in the, in, in the experiment. And he was told, uh, I don't know if he was a graduate student or an intern, he was told to uh, test a certain material. But he didn't speak English very well. So he tasted this material. And he said, hey, it's sweet. That was the discovery of sucralose. Thanks uh, to somebody who didn't speak English too, very, too well at all. Oh, wait, that's going backwards. Here we go again. It doesn't want me to get beyond a certain point. Hello, I've been there. This is giving me a headache. It's not working. It is not working. It's showing me the sky. Ah, back to the beginning. We were there. Can't get past that point. Okay. Yeah, this one we didn't see. This is an interesting slide, actually. It shows that there's a long time delay, or what could be a long time delay, between a discovery and its use. Uh, from the CCD discovery, the charge coupled device, to the, to the digital camera took six years. From the transistor to the transistor radio took seven years. But from general relativity to the GPS system took 78 years. Or from the discovery of that light can make electrical effects uh, to the discovery, uh, to the development of solar panels took 115 years. So the, the latency period between a discovery and its use can be very long. Wow, it does, a, it really likes to get me that. I don't know. Do I really want to do this anymore? About uh, try to. Why does this not work? What am I doing wrong? I think they're fixing it now. I oh yeah, here's isotopes. It. Do I dare go backwards? Yes, I want it. Yeah, it, now it works. Okay, depends where I stand. Uh, isotopes are really interesting creatures. It's uh, isotopes are instances where atoms have almost identical chemical properties but different masses. And they were found around 1912 and 1913. And with the discovery of isotopes and the discovery of the neutron, uh, nuclear physics evolved. And uh, nuclear physics from A to Z is very simple. Every atomic nucleus is characterized by two numbers. One of them is A, the number of neutrons and protons in the nucleus. The other is Z, the number of protons in the nucleus. And if you know A and Z, you know which nucleus you're talking about. I'll give some examples, but we all have seen examples. Isotopes became very useful. Nuclear fission was discovered in 1938. It led scientists to realize that U-235 could be used to make bombs or to make to make power at a nuclear reactor. Willard Libby, in 1948, invented uh, carbon dating. And with carbon dating, you can tell how old things were, certain things. For example, the Shroud of Turin was something that was considered to be holy by the Catholic Church. It was thought to be the clothing of Jesus Christ at some point in his death. Uh, and, uh, Tests were made with the collaboration of the Catholic Church, and it was found that the Shroud of Turin was a fake. That is to say, it was made in the 15th or 16th century, long after uh, Jesus Christ had lived. Carbon dating was also used uh, to show that the Vikings, who had uh, apparently settled in Canada, had preceded Columbus to America. Isotopes have become extremely useful. Here are some of the subjects in which isotopes can be used, ranging from art preservation to insect control to looking for oil 
to health science, to runway lighting in, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, at Alaska, to testing engines, to paleontology, to astrophysics, all over the place. So isotopes, starting as just a curiosity, became extremely important. <laughs> Hello. I am certainly doing something wrong, but I don't know what. Good. I, I, I don't know what's going on. This is N. Oh, so yeah, you, you think I'm pushing that by mistake. Aha. I talked about particle accelerators. The most useless of them, from the practical point of view, is the one that made the discovery just a few years ago of the Higgs boson, which completed the standard model of elementary particles. However, uh, it's the largest accelerator in the world, but there are 30,000 particle accelerators out there, atom smashers, if you will, most of them used for practical purposes. So something that started off as an instrument for basic science is now used all over the place for medical therapy, for isotope synthesis, to make computer chips, uh, to detect trace elements, uh, for corrosion and erosion studies, you name it, looking for contaminants in semiconductors, ultra-safe nuclear power reactors, and possibly for large-scale magnetic energy storage. So accelerators are used all over the place. It's a multi-billion dollar uh, industry. And there's a certain special type of accelerator called a synchrotron light source. These things exist in many countries, I think 20 different countries, uh, have, have synchrotron light sources. They're expensive toys. The nearest one to here, perhaps, is Spring 8 in, in Japan. I was talking, uh, in Jakarta, a student came to me and said he wanted to do research uh, which required a synchrotron light source, and could I talk to his government to encourage them to, dis to invest in a synchrotron light source in this country? Would be a good idea. Uh, the most recent one built, incidentally, was built in Jordan. It's called Sesame, and that's a particularly interesting device because it's, it is to be used in collaboration uh, between the neighboring Arab countries, that is to say Iraq and Iran and Jordan and such, and Egypt, and Israel. So there, at this accelerator located in Jordan, scientists from Israel and the nearby Arab countries are working together on experiments. Now these synchrotron light sources are used for many, many purposes. Some pure science. Here I have listed five years in which chemistry Nobel Prize, Prizes depended on the use of this device. But they're used all over the place for nanoscience, pharmacology, cancer therapy, imaging crystals, proteins, viruses, uh, analyzing strains, cracks and corrosion, Paleoentomology, the study of ancient bugs, biochemistry, archaeology, you name it. Useful things. Oh, I hit the wrong button again, but now I've been told how to fix it. Number theory. Now, number theory, people were interested in number theory for, since 2800 before Christ. The ancient Sumerians did wonderful things in number theory. But it's completely useless, it would seem. A famous mathematician in 1840 said, there is one science whose very remoteness from ordinary human activities should keep it gentle and clean. However, <laughs> number theory is the basis for encryption, for cryptography. And uh, the National Security Administration in my country employs many, many, many cryptographers using number theory. Number theory is used by the military, by industry, for encryption and decryption. It's used for electronic, electronic money, for gaming, for financial services, for computational biology, for online payments, finance, industry, military, governments. It's used all over the place for many, many purposes. 
a useless science indeed. There is no such thing as a useless science. Uh, this is uh, sort of my last slide. Uh, this slide has to do with the vice versa in the title to this lecture, which is that technology drives progress in basic science too. And here we have steam engines, which were invented in the early 19th century, long before they could be understood. And steam engines were obviously very useful things, but how did they work? And people, scientists, got very curious about that, developing the science of thermodynamics, inspired by devices which were built by engineers. Later in the 19th century, a num some of my favorite engineers invented interesting things, spark coils, which produce high voltages, invented by a guy named Rumkorf, photography by Daguerre, air pumps by Geisler. They, these turn of the century discoveries made possible the discovery of radio waves, x-rays, radioactivity, the electron, atomic number, cathode ray tubes, all of those developments, scientific developments, followed from the inventions of engineers. We spoke about the cosmic microwave background and how important that discovery was. The antenna that Penzias and Wilson used to discover the cosmic microwave uh, radiation was built by AT&T for entirely other purposes. They were investigating possibilities of communication via satellite. Gamma ray bursts were discovered by the US military. And this has to do with the nuclear test ban agreement that banned tests of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. And we Americans were very suspicious of the Soviets, thinking that they might violate the test ban agreement. So we put satellites up that could look for Soviet violations. There were no Soviet violations. But the, these satellites discovered signals not coming from Russia, but coming from outer space. Uh, they, these were classified for many years, and when they were released, uh, it, they became of great importance. They were very mysterious things, which are now much less is, ex mysterious. I think we are beginning to understand just what they are. Supercomputers are very useful devices. The world's largest supercomputer, most powerful supercomputer, is in China. Uh, they're very practical devices, but they can do basic science as well. And they're used by mathematicians to prove uh, fundamental theories in mathematics, which are pure, pure mathematics, like the four-color theorem, like the prime-pair theorem, which have no real practical importance. Uh, but we use these computers, they use these computers to make these discoveries. Oh, is, I don't know if we have time. Are we running out of time? Have we, we're approaching the end of time. Well, not the end of time. That's another issue, which is very interesting. But I don't have time to talk about synthetic elements and nuclear fission. I don't have time to talk about the, uh, uh, about the wonderful discoveries that have been made in the form of nuclear chemistry. We'll save that for another time. I would thank you very much for your patience. Sorry about my confusion with the mechanical device. I'm, I'm never, I'm a theoretical physicist, and I, when I was at Cornell University taking a course in physics, they told me to leave the laboratory that I will never be an experimental physicist. They were right. Thank you very much, Professor Glasso. Your lecture was very inspiring for us, and it is very clear on how we have uh, the basic science and applied science, and one reinforce another like that. Now we come to the QA session. We have three microphones there, here in the middle, and there on the right side, and. We invite directly the students and also the guests here
to ask for the question to Professor Glashow. We will have around 20 minutes to, for, for this QA session. So please make a line if you would like to ask question in the middle, right and uh, left side. Thank you, Mr. Grasnow. Uh, Mr. Grasnow, I would. So now, first from the middle, Professor Glashow will stay there, and please identify yourself before asking question. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Glasnow. My name is Fauzan. I would like to ask. A question regarding basic science research. Is there any prospect for basic science research in the future? As far as, as, far as I am concerned, there would be less funding from government for basic science research since pe people and the government think they are not as prospectful as applied research. Thank you. So the question from Fauzan. Are you asking about research in this country or research in the world? <coughs> Let me address the issue of uh, basic research uh, in Indonesia. Uh, this is something that was touched upon by my colleague, Sir Richard, uh, and he mentioned the, the wondrous uh, diversity of, of life on the various many islands of this uh, multi-island nation. Uh, all kinds of, of different bacteria remain to be discovered and classified and made use of. Plants that may have wonderful medical properties remain to be studied. Animals may also be investigated. There's a huge variety of life to, to, to study from which practical things can, can take place. But that's biology. Let me turn to physics, which is my specialty. Energy in particular. In this country, you are burning uh, fossil fuels uh, to, to make your energy. This country ought to be to make use of solar, solar energy big time, because the, the country has many topographical aspects which make it possible to store energy, to use uh, pumped water storage, because when you have uh, at two lakes at uh, different altitudes, you can pump, pump water up uh, when you have extra energy and get the energy out when it comes down, and this can be very efficient. Being an island nation, you can, uh, I imagine the, cons the possible construction of saltwater lakes, which can pump water up to mountainless, from which you, to which you can pump water from the ocean uh, to the artificial lake and store the energy in this fashion. That way, this country can turn completely to solar energy, collecting it in the daytime, storing it at night, and becoming a beacon to other nations uh, so that they too can turn to solar energy. So that, that is a possible, maybe it's technologically difficult, maybe it's impossible, maybe my idea is silly, but I was just thinking of it as a possible direction for research in energy in this country. Thank you very much. And now we ask for the right side to ask question. Yeah, please identify yourself and where are you from? From the from what faculty you are from? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Glaso. My name is Hendry Istiawan from Faculty of Engineering Gajah Ma Universitas Gajah Mada. My question is about that you have stated uh, there's no useless discipline. But that makes me intrigued about how the, your view of the superstring theory, sir. Thank you. Uh, well, superstring theory. Uh, I'll repeat what I said elsewhere. Uh, that I was very much uh, suspicious of superstring theory long ago in 1987, which is 30 over 30 years ago. And at that time, a superstring theorist and I 
Paul Ginspar, wrote a paper called Desperately Seeking Superstrings. And you can find that on the web, Desperately Seeking Superstrings. And we criticize superstring theory because it cannot be proven to be wrong. If you ask a superstring theorist if there is any experiment that he can imagine, the result to which would contradict the theory, he would say, no, there is no such experiment that can be done. There is no experiment that can tell whether superstring theory is false, if it is false. It cannot be falsified. It certainly cannot pr be proven to be correct, but it certainly cannot be proven to be wrong. Therefore, like various philosophical disciplines, like the relative advantage of parliamentary government uh, to uh, presidential governments, you can argue about which is better, but there's no real answer to that question. Thank you. So I think that uh, Well, what more can I say? What more can I say? I give up. Can you go? No, no, I, I, I've lost track of the question. I'm sorry. I'm having, I'm so tired that I've forgotten the question that I was trying to answer. If you could remind me, I'll just continue. Thank you very much, Professor Glashow. Now we continue to the next, uh, from the left side, please. Uh, thank, thank you for the time. Uh, uh, my name is Girang. Actually, I am from F Faculty of Economics and Business. And actually, uh, what I want to ask you is that how to make sure that when we do an Kantian approach to uh, research or in development, we make sure that we always have support from the people, we have soft support of the government, because in research, it, we, of course, we need the money and we need the, res we, we need, we need the resource to do, to do that. And sometimes it's not that we don't want to research about it, it's sometimes there is lack of support, money, and resource that broke us from doing this new discoveries of invention. So how to go around against that? Because your field is actually interesting. Maybe you can yeah, well, that, yeah, give yes. a slide. This is a central issue. The, I'm told that something like 0.2% of the gross national, of the, uh, of the available monies are spent on, on basic research. And most of that 0.2% is committed by, is, is not uh, flexible in the least. There isn't enough money to do basic research in this country. That's a serious problem. It's the same problem that I saw when I was in Vietnam and people were asking me at the highest level of government, what can we do to encourage basic research in Vietnam? And, and the answer that we gave them was you have to pay the professors more money because the professors are paid so poorly that they have to spend most of their time doing other things, things other than basic research. And I suspect this is true in this country as well. Uh, if you really are serious about entering the, the world of basic research, and it doesn't have to be the kind of research that I do, it doesn't have to do with elementary particles or with the fate of the universe, it has to do with real useful things like making this country strong. And uh, if the country wants to be strong, it has to spend a little bit of money on the infrastructure of research and development, especially basic research. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, the next, please. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Ms. Bahul Munir. I am from Spolo November Institute of Technology in Surabaya. First of all, I would like to thank to you for your great lecture today. Uh, my question is, currently Indonesia and many developing world need more engineers rather than scientists. So it makes many brightest students go to study in uh, engineering rather than 
uh, pure and uh, natural sciences. So there was, uh, you know, lack of groundbreaking research and discoveries uh, in many developing nations. From your perspective, how to solve this problem? Thank you. Well, that's the same. The solution is always the same: uh, money, uh, because. <laughs> If you have, a, I've met a number of young people here who really want to do basic research, uh, and they're getting a very good education in this country. The educational system is marvelous here. I've seen now a number of institutions. People, these kids get well educated, and if they really want to do basic research, they, they go to a graduate school in America or in England or in Canada, and they get their graduate education there and they probably stay there, you would probably lose these people, because they cannot have positions here. They cannot do research here if there is no money available, if there's nothing, nothing analogous to the, to the National Institute of Health or the National Science Foundation or the Department of Energy that provides money for basic research. Of course, they will, take, they will leave this country and have successful careers elsewhere. You want to keep your best and brightest minds in this country, to develop this country. Uh, it it's, remains a developing country. You want to put an end to developing and become developed. Just pay for it. The next from the right side. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Isma from Uin Sunan Kalijaga. Uh, I have read uh, about two friends. Name is Albert Einstein and Noam Chomsky. Uh, they are have two methods that different. If Albert Einstein he he in Rome and he invent about big invention and uh, Noam is go out from from his country and. He come from East Asia and and he meet with proletarian and citizen in there and they and, and he also uh, make a big big invention and and, and about your lecture in accident, accidental and invention is very very interesting also too for me. Uh, we know in Indonesia. Uh, you you say in front that Indonesia is a big 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 population. They have much population, uh, and the system education in here is very bad. I think uh, they uh, especially in the scientists and the, in the science uh, very memory just memory that that the teacher give to us. And uh, I, I I will ask you. Uh, if you Indonesian person, what the best system that will you suggest from education system in Indonesia, especially in science? Thank you. Well, thank you. That was a very long question, and I'm afraid I don't know what the question is. <laughs> I, I, my hearing is not that great, and uh, I, I, if uh, someone she, can tell me comes, what the question uh, was, I will yes. try my best to answer it. She comes from the Sunan Kalijogo. She's uh, from the religions and uh, philosophical university like that. And she's asking about the education system, which is the best because she the what, feels... The what system? Education. Education. education system. Because she feels that we are more in memorizing something rather than understanding Thank something. You. Now I understand her. Thank you very much. Uh, Yes, that is a, a serious question. The trouble is, of course, that I do not know anything about the educational system in this country. Uh, I just know that I meet kids who are well-educated. So something sometimes works. Uh, maybe it doesn't always work. It is certainly true that in some countries, especially China, uh, r education is, is considered very, very important but it is done in a very, in a way which suppresses curiosity, which uh, it, it forces kids to uh, learn by rote rather than by personal individual investigation. Uh, that may explain why uh, China 
is not developing in basic research. It's developing in engineering. It's developing technologically. But the number of uh, basic scientists uh, who are making serious contributions is there, but it's relatively small for such a gigantic country. Rote learning is uh, very suppressive of curiosity. Curiosity is the one of the greatest blessings that people have. And as the previous speaker this morning argued, all too often the curiosity of a young mind is suppressed by the forces of rigorous uh, education. Children must be allowed to investigate the world in the same way that young creatures of uh, lesser creatures are free to investigate the world without constraints. Thank you. Yeah, please, uh, from the left side. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Aulia Rahman. I came from Civil Engineering Faculty of Engineers in Gajamada University. So, uh, I see a great uh, question to your subject in physics. So, uh, a simple question is, how to maintain that great passion for the subject that you love. And then uh, the second question is, uh, do you have any biography books? Because Richard P. Feynman's biography motivates me a lot. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't quite hear the question. How to maintain the passion for the science? Yeah. Oh. Uh, do I have a bi I have written a, a, a more or less biographical book, which is completely out of print. It's called Interactions. Uh, so aside from that, uh, I, I wrote another semi-biographical book called The Charm of Physics, but that also is out of print. But I have a few copies of Interaction at home, but I don't have them with me, otherwise I would give them to you. It's not a very good book. I wrote it a long time ago. So Professor Glasho has a book uh, called Interaction, but he has uh, no more that books, yeah? Uh, the first question. Uh, the first question is about the how to maintain the passion for, for uh, learning something or the subject like that. Yeah. What you need is a uh, school system which encourages curiosity and individuality. What you need are uh, facilities uh, that enable a person who wants to be a scientist rather than an engineer to be a scientist. Engineers are good and they're important and you, you need engineers, of course, there's no question of that. But you also need scientists who are open-minded and who can point to new directions in which the country can go rather than engineers who continue doing what has been done before. So uh, I, as I say, I'm, th there is a problem that we're getting here. Many of you think that because Sir Richard and I have won Nobel Prizes, that we can solve any problem. But that's not true. Uh, we can solve some problems having to do with science. But I don't think we're capable of solving the uh, problem of how to uh, develop inquiring minds in this country. That's a very deep problem uh, that requires investigation from the very top and requires money as well. Sometimes, uh, well, I have to say that when I was at the Binnis School uh, in, in Jakarta, uh, I had the feeling that those kids were really learning things and we're developing uh, very, very uh, acute intellects. And so it can be done, but it's very expensive. Professor Glasso, and I'm sorry, I'm worried that we cannot continue the QA sessions because of uh, the time. And Professor Glasho, your inventions lead to the understanding about the universe. What will you advise to us and to the students uh, in, in our lives like that? Yeah. 
please advise us on on that because uh, we know that that your inventions lead to the understanding deep understanding of the universe yes uh, indeed uh, what I and my colleagues <clears throat> have done is to try to understand this wonderful world that we have been given, that we are born to. And I think it is a sacred obligation of all of us to try to understand this world and this universe. But what can I say to you if you, uh, this country needs research it doesn't particularly need to participate in the search for the basic building blocks of matter to search to an understanding of quarks, an understanding of string theory. Uh, that's uh, not what this country needs at the moment. What this country needs at the moment is a stronger infrastructure and a, a, a more, an approach to questions of energy that will reduce the emissions of carbon dioxide that are poisoning the atmosphere throughout the world. There are very practical things that are have, to, have to be done in this country, which I think come first. And I think, yes, you need basic research, but you need basic research that aims toward practical development. Once the country achieves an appropriate level, then you can proceed further. My, my dear friend, Abdus Salam, we began this talk by talking, by my mentioning Abdus Salam was dedicated to the uh, return of, base, of pure science to the countries, to the, under, the underdeveloped countries of the world. He wanted countries like Nigeria and Yemen to come back into the world of, uh, of, of basic science. I think he was overreaching a bit. What countries like Yemen and, and Nigeria need, need is to become, to reach a higher level of development. Now, you are not such a country as that, but yet you want to be a first world country. And for that, you should have a serious and substantive effort in basic science. And I would hope that your government recognizes the need for basic science and for curiosity-driven education and research. Thank you. Very touching message, Professor Glasho, and I think we have a tough agenda after this to develop our country based on your lectures and your inspirational messages. Thank you very much. And this is the end of the QA sessions, and I would like to return to the protocols. Thank you. The Rector of Universitas Gajah Mada concludes officially the lecture and the conference ceremony. The Nobel Laureate's lectures and ceremony of the conferment of honorary doctoral degree for Professor Sheldon L. Glashow and Dr. Sir Richard J. Roberts are formally closed. Great appreciation. Great appreciation and acknowledgement is directed to the International Peace Foundation as well as Tahir Foundation for supporting this Nobel Laureate lectures and also directed to the promoters, academic senate, board of professors, board of trustee, students, and the organizer of the committee for the preparation and the arrangement of these lectures. Thank you very much. Pimpinan Universitas Gajah Mada, Dewan Guru Besar, Tim Promotor dan Promo Vendors meninggalkan tempat upacara. Hadirin dimohon berdiri.
Hadirin dimohon duduk kembali. Please be seated. Dan akhirnya kami ucapkan terima kasih. Thank you, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you.